Well, this is part seven of a reading of the socialist the response to anti-Semitism in Imperial German state time of the Second International, which flowed into the Third International, and uh, has appeared uh, in uh, certain Marxist uh, platforms during this uh, genocidal attack on Gaza by the Zionist state. Even the Israeli Marxist opposition refers to Jewish supremacy or a Jewish state, and they are thoroughly mistaken because that is Zionist terminology. So in effect, they are still Zionists, even though they're opposed to Zionism. All they've been able to pick up is some populist verbiage to express a sentiment without analysis. The analysis, though, is provided by the Jewish Bund. And the Jewish Bund was very much aware of the lack of appreciation of the identity of the Jewish people and the existence of the Jewish people during uh, the last uh, 200 years. So we're going to go back to the uh, work of Lars Fischer to analyze why. Why or oh why? Okay, let's go share here. Where are you? Oh boy. Okay, let's go to uh, Navigator here. And then we can switch over to the response, the socialist response to anti-Semitism in Imperial Germany. Okay. Let's catch up to, uh, I think it's page 54 or 59. Just about to discuss Karl Liebknecht. I uh, know. Well, this is a long book. Okay. And we're just getting started. Yeah, let's see that. I think it's down here. Marrying, yes. Marrying's wall, yes, okay, we've read that. And here we are. Wilhelm Liebknecht and the Judenfrage. <clears throat> okay, and you'll sip here. In Lipnik's case, this contention is all the more remarkable because he made a substantial reference to Sir Judenfrage in his Marx memoirs. This seems to have gone unnoticed in the literature, even though these memoirs are a crucial source for the debate concerning the conversion of Marx's father, Heinrich Marx, 1782 to 1838. They offer not only Liebknecht's own view on the matter, more importantly, they include a text by Marx's younger daughter, Eleanor Marx, 1855 to 1898, generally known as Tussie, in which she responds, responded to a number of questions raised by Liebknecht, including the issue of her grandfather's conversion. But notes. She claimed quite correctly as we now know, that Heinrich Marx had converted to save, and perhaps even further, his career. Marx's last surviving daughter, Laura Lafuge, 1846-1911, later sought to deny this contention of her younger and by then deceased sister. She did so with Kautsky's support and based on Mehring's account. Liefnick himself, by contrast, had subscribed to the younger sister's version of events. The pagan French, quote-unquote, Liebknecht explained at the outset of his Marx memoirs, had granted equality to all human beings in the Rhineland 
and thus, quote, relieve the Jews of the curse of a millennium of persecution and oppression, making them citizens and human beings. The Christian Germanic spirit of the Holy Alliance, however, subsequently, quote, rejected the pagan French spirit of equality and aspired to a renewal of the old curse. Shortly after the birth of the boy, Karl Marx, an edict was issued that forced all the Jews to choose between either letting themselves be baptized or relinquishing all public um, amtlich offices and professions. Whoa, heavy duty. Marx's father, a respected Jewish lawyer and notary and advocate at the district court, submitted to the inevitable and together with his family converted to Christianity. Aha! Liebnik then added that somewhat dubious remark that 20 years later, the man that boy had become gave his first response to this violation, Gewaltschicht, with his text on the Jewish question. And his whole life was the revenge. It is hard to say how exactly Liebnik meant this remark. It would seem to imply that much, though, Karl Marx was irked by this injustice that the Jews had experienced and the desire to respond to it was at least one of the motives that drove him throughout his life. Yet it remains unclear whether Liebknecht thought of this desire as a conscious or more of a subconscious motive force. Nor does Liebknecht's formulation necessarily imply that Marx responded to this injustice by making the cause of the Jews, qua Jews, his own. More likely, and near the truth, would be that Liebknecht simply meant this, the experience of this injustice. Close to home, sharpened Marx's sense for all forms of injustice, and thus helped generate his urge to search for comprehensive solutions that would rectify the problems of Jews and non-Jews alike. As we will see, Mehring nevertheless felt the need to ring the anti-philosemitic alarm bells in response to the statement by Liebnik. Laura Larfuge had occasion to comment on the matter in response to an inquiry from John Spargo of 1876-1966. At the end of 1907, she insisted that her grandfather had converted freely and not in obedience to any official edict. He believed in God, he told his son, as Newton, Locke, and Leibniz, 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 Leibniz uh, uh, had done before him. He also believed in Voltaire. The Farg recommended that Spargo should turn to Mehring's introduction and the Nachlach der Globe. There he would find the fullest information and abundant material, historical and biographical, on her father. In the Nachlass aus Glaube, Mehring explicitly rejected Liebnik's version of events. He added that the connection Liebnik had drawn between the alleged reason for the conversion and Zerjugendfrage suggested that his content was of a nature entirely at odds with the text's actual thrust. Mehring apparently feared that Liebnik's account might lead people to believe that Jörg Jugendfrage was essentially a philosemitic text. Kautsky too directed Spargo towards Nachlassoflo. Writing to Spargo in the spring of 1908, he explained that Mad, Lafargue is quite right with her statement on the renunciation of the Jewish religion by Karl. That's an error, Marx, because it's supposed to be referring to his father. Liebknecht was mistaken, but not Mary, who had dealt with the matter in Nachlass of Globe. Mehring's preface and commentaries to that edition are of the most utmost importance for anyone writing on Marx. This was an obvious blanket recommendation. Had Kautsky had misgivings about Mehring's treatment of 
der Judenfrage, in the Nachlass of Lob, then this surely would have been the most suitable opportunity to indicate them in however guarded fashion especially given that Kautsky was making this recommendation specifically in connection with the Jewish background of Marx's family. This makes it highly unlikely that Kautsky was simply praising the Nachlaus of Lob in general at the expense of possibly misgivings regarding Mehring's presentation of Zer Jugendfrage in particular. Uh, a little drink here. Now, Spargo presumably consulted Laura Lafargue, Lafargue, assuming she could provide him with first-hand information based either on documents in her position or on authentic personal recollections of one kind or another. The authenticity of these recollections, however, and the exact nature of her explicit recourse to Mehring present us with something of a chicken and egg issue. Not least in an attempt to shore up his own position against Kautsky and Ryazanov, Mehring later related in the introduction to his Marx biography on what good terms he had been with Laura Lafargue as the last intimate heir of Karl Marx. She had sent him friendly greetings only hours before her death, he claimed. I'd earned her friendship and trust, he explained. Quote, not because she considered me the most scholarly or ingenuous of her father's students, but because she considered me the one who had penetrated his human nature more deep, most deeply and knew how to portray it most accurately. In letters and in direct conversations alike, she frequently assured me that many a largely faded recollection of her parental home had become fresh and vivid again. Many a name she had frequently heard her parents mention had only emerged from the shadows and become a concrete character for her due to the, the account in my party history and especially in my Nachlass of Globe. Unquote. We might well wonder then whether her certainty about the circumstances of her grandfather's conversion was also among the quote, almost faded recollections unquote, rendered fresh and vivid again by Mehring's account. Alternatively, Lafargue may well have been the main source of Mehring's version of events in the first place. Either way, I would suggest that we are well advised to treat Mehring and Lafargue essentially as one source, as far as the issue of Heinrich Marx's conversion is concerned, and not as two sources that could bear each other out. Liebnick, in his Marx memories, memoirs, to return to our main argument, subsequently concluded a relatively detailed section on the Deutsche Französische Jahrbuche by offering, quote, a sample and a stylistic sample at that from the journal. That sample was the final section of the second part of Serieur Judenfrage. He chose an excerpt making for no less than one and a half pages of text, equivalent to roughly one full page in the MEW. With the language of the Hegel school, Liebnick then added, okay, there's the footnotes. That which Mark still speaks in this treatise, the reader may grapple as best he can. Yet, the train of thought anyone can grasp. Marx understands the Jewish question as an economic question. It's a question of the capitalist system. Uh, that's an error. The persecution of the Jews, the name anti-Semitism had not yet become fashionable, is a mere competitive envy of the Christian huckstering vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish huckstering. And only once human society has emancipated itself from this huckstering spirit, i.e. to express it in modern terms from capitalism will the Jews be emancipated like all other human beings and nations? Hence, then, we already, already find the idea of the Communist Manifesto and the International Workers' Association. Unquote. Now, for all that Liebknecht's Marx memoirs sought to give themselves a casual 
and incidental air, it is no coincidence that they were published in the year following Engels's death. With Engels no longer around, Liebknecht could claim, with some justification, to be the only senior figure in the party who could bear witness to the ongoings in the Marx household between the late 1840s and the early 1860s. It seems evident enough that Liebknecht not only presented these recollections to fulfill his duties as an eyewitness while he still could, he in fact did so in a very conscious attempt to stake a claim as Engels' true successor at the helm of the movement. He comparatively detailed discussion of the Deutsche Französische Jahrbücher and lofty dismissal of Hegelian, Hegelian diction Marx still employed there, most likely reflect an attempt by Liebknecht to emphasize his intellectual stature and thereby to unscore the legitimacy of his claim. At the same time, it seems likely that the final section of the second part of Zerjudenfrage struck him as a particularly suitable sample, not least because it was the only part of Marx's contribution to the Deutsche Französische Jahrbuch that he could really make head or tails of. This much is beyond doubt, though. Liebknecht's comments on this excerpt from Zier Jugendfrage may not make an awful lot of sense, but they are obviously strongly aff affirmative and make the suggestion that he certainly never justified Zier Jugendfrage simply untenable. Okay, break time. Okay, Shabbos arrives, and we have the uh, Shabbos clan, uh, candelabra from the Parashava uh, Loja Mutual Benefit Society, the Association of uh, uh, Jewish Refugees Survivors of the Holocaust who uh, gather together in Toronto. And we say Shabbos like this. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech alom, kol bidvara, lahadlik sheach Shabbos. Missing a candle this week. Okay. Yeah, that's a better view. Yeah. Okay, I'll be right back. Okay, we will resume the reading of the socialist response to anti-Semitism in the imperial German state, which, similar condition under which we endure in the West, in the United States of America presently. So it's the most appropriate reading that we conduct here. Here it is. Okay. In fact, this was by no means Liebknecht's first close encounter with Zer Jungfrage. When, as already mentioned, the Berliner Volksblatt published Zer Jungfrage in six installments in October 1890, Liebknecht was its editor-in-chief. He had moved from Leipzig to Berlin on the 20th of September to take over the paper. Shortly before his departure, Adolf Pischler, a party veteran from Hanover, had visited him in Liebensick and on the occasion suggested him that he publish Zer Jugendfrage in the Berliner Volksblatt, People's Sheet. Or Volksblatt is like 
the sheet of a newspaper, but it's not called a newspaper, it's called a sheet. Okay. Liebnick has responded positively, and on the 4th of October, Pischler sent him the first part of the manuscript that I promised you in Leipzig, quote unquote. Pischler had offered to prepare the text for publication since Liebnick did not have a copy of the Deutsche Französische Jahrbücher at his disposal. I am already looking forward to the capers. Capers, our opponents, especially the anti Semites, will cut when the article is published. Pischler wrote in another letter. It will be hilarious. On the 30th of October, 1890, Pischler could promptly report to Liebnick that, quote, we are embroiled in a struggle with the anti Semites here, with the latter have finally broken their silence on Karl Marx's article, Zur Judenfrage, a merry Jewish debate, the Juden debat, will most likely now unfold, to say the least. The short preface to the first installment in the Berlin of Volksblatt pointed out that Marx's famous essay on the Jewish question that has recently been referred to frequently because of its topicality had originally been published in Deutsche Französische Jahrbücher. Copies of this publication were extremely rare, and a more comprehensive edition of Marx's collected works was hardly imminent. Hence, well, we want to make this ingenious, genial piece of work by the emergent master that has hitherto only been known to a small minority available to the German public by publishing it in the columns of our paper. Liebnick had, in fact, been trying to gain Engels's support for a Gesamtstau low. Gold. Complete edition. Gesamtstoskop. Complete edition of Marx's and Engels's work. Engels, however, had shown himself categorically opposed to this idea. Alternatively, Liebnick has suggested the publication of all of Marx's and Engels' contributions to the Deutsche Französische Jahrbücher in pamphlet form, including the correspondence between Rouge and Marx. Ein Brief von 1843. Pischler continuously encouraged this endeavor and encouraged Liebnick along. He supplied Liebnick with copies of the relevant material from the Deutsche Französische Jahrbücher and also offered to proofread the final version. The text of Zer Judenfrage in the Berliner Volksblatt had been replete with typos, he remarked on 14th of December. And on the 6th of January, 1891, he sent Liebnick a corrected version. A few days earlier, he had promised to give his own copy of the Deutsche Französische Jahrbücher to Liebnick as a present if he decided to reprint all the relevant texts. Quote, it is for me, for me, it is only important that I own a complete edition, whether it is the original or a reprint is neither here nor there. Engels still had some doubts, though. Writing to Liebnick in the 14th of December, 1890, he especially questioned the merit of publishing both his muddled correspondence, unquote, between Rouge and Marx, quote, which is today quite incomprehensible in its Hegelianized Verhegelgeld language. Verhegelt. Mm. <laughs> Hegel's, yeah, in uh, in in Hegel's language, as if Hegel had his own language. He added that I readily give this consent to the reprinting in pamphlet form of such individual pieces by Marx as are comprehensible today without annotation and commentary, just to their reprinting, that is, without any annotation and commentary. Any other endeavors he would nip in the bud. Uh, in addition of these earlier the early texts without any annotation and commentary was hardly a viable project, and this presumably explains why Liebnick's plan to publish the text from the Deutsche Französische Jahrbücher was subsequently abandoned. At no point throughout these deliberations did anybody suggest, however, that it might be questionable to continue reprinting the Judenfrage. It was considered an integral part of Marx's early writings. Hence the notion that Liebnick never justified it is true at best in the sense that he would not have understood the need to do so in the first place. Far from being reluctant to refer to it, he counted Zerjudenfrage among Marx's particularly authoritative statements 
and readily took recourse to it when he felt it suited his purposes. Okay. Good enough for today. Okay. Uh, let me record some Yiddish, you know, just for the sake of having Yiddish recorded and pre preserved. Let's make an episode in Yiddish. This man has to speak. This might be in Yiddish. Oicha. Yiddish man meant yes. Also, I'm going to mit den Füßen in der Gewinn jeden. Nicht zionen. In seiner jeden. Nicht zionen. Also, ich darf mir reden. So, ich darf mir sie äh, wissen. Mir hat sie der Chassidim jetzt. Das kennt Frau Steiner ein bisschen Jiddisch. Nicht alle. Wir gerät mit der Sache. Chassidim, nach dem Wein, bei der jüdischen äh, Campus Center. Me, aber es hat nicht gerät mit mir in Jiddisch. Als, also, es hat nicht gekannt, wir reden Jiddisch. Der Beste, es hat gekannt, wir reden Jiddisch, es ist gewesen Mädel. Es ist gekannt, es ist gewesen Mädel. Es ist gekannt, es ist gewesen Mädel. Also, ich will reden mit dem, was in Jiddisch. Wer kann reden mit mir in Jiddisch? Also, keine nicht. Das ist der Schandig. Und das ist der Fall von der Zionium, das hat ein gehaget, die jüdische Sprache. Jüdische Redders in seine Jiden. Du verstehst? <lacht> 